Hi everyone, my name is Bhavik Bhandari. I'm a gastroenterologist here at Cascade Valley Medical Center in Bristol. And to be medical group as well as for the gastro. Um, our goal today is to talk about GI disorders and what are some common GI disorders and what causes them. I've been in practice for about a decade or so and I love to take care of patients with all different sorts of ailments of the GI tract. With that, let's get into some questions. So the first question is, which organs are included in the digestive tract? So the way I like to think of it is from top to bottom, really. The esophagus, which is your food pipe, your main way you swallow food down. It's your stomach, which helps you process food. The small intestine, which helps you absorb lots of nutrients. And then it gets down to the colon, which is your large intestine, which helps store stools and with other processes. Other organs include the pancreas, which is towards the middle of the stomach in the back, as well as the gallbladder and the liver. So those are some of the most common and most frequently uh, seen organs within the GI tract. What are the most common GI disorders? So the second question is what are some of the most common GI disorders? Some of the most common GI disorders we see are acid reflux disease, also known as GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, chronic diarrhea or constipation, along with things such as peptic ulcer disease or ulcer disease of the stomach uh, or small bowel, diverticulitis, gallstones or gallbladder related disease, diseases of the pancreas, which include pancreatitis and inflammation of the pancreas, as well as disorders of the liver, things like fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, and other items. Some other diseases to think about are also eosinophilic esophagitis, celiac disease, as well as many others within the GI tract. Can gastrointestinal diseases be prevented? So the next question is, can gastrointestinal diseases be prevented? Certainly, many gastrointestinal diseases can be prevented. They could be delayed in terms of their onset, and their severity can be diminished by taking the right steps. And a few of the right steps are things that you've probably heard about and, and known about before. And I think it always starts with sort of what we put into our bodies and diet and nutrition. So lots of time, some of the causative agents or things that put us over the line for certain disorders are certain foods that we eat and how they're processed and broken down, as well as things that we drink in terms of our calories as well as our intake. So the diet and nutrition aspect is a big aspect of preventing GI disorder, as well as physical activity and lifestyle. How we eat, when we eat, how we move about throughout the day really makes a difference in terms of what happens to us and our bodies as well as our digestive tract. So the diet end is one, and behavioral lifestyle exercise end is the other side of things, ways to prevent GI disease. What are some symptoms to look out for in terms of what could identify a GI disorder? So there's many symptoms to really think about and really see a doctor for. So starting up top, if you have any difficulty swallowing or feeling of food getting stuck in the chest, as well as burning in the chest or sensation of liquid coming up to the back of your throat or chronic cough, those could all be signs of you know, esophageal disease. Abdominal pain is always a big one, which could have many causes, as well as nausea and vomiting, which could be related. Trouble moving your bowels or moving your bowels too frequently. Seeing blood in the stool or really black color stools, what's also known as melana, could be a sign of internal bleeding, which should be uh, watched out for, as well as things like weight loss, decreased appetite, all things that could signal something underlying. Other things to look out for are yellowing of the eyes or yellowing of the skin, which may identify a liver-based disorder. In certain times, many rashes can be related to GI disorders, which can frequently get missed. So really, if you're having trouble with digestion, trouble with eating, as well as trouble moving your bowels, those are issues that you should consider seeing a gastroenterologist about. What is the most overlooked GI disorder? Ah, the question is, what is the most overlooked GI disorder? I would say there's a few disorders which are overlooked or are not as well known, but are actually quite common. So one is called eosinophilic esophagitis. That's where we have 
particular type of cell deposit in the lining of our esophagus, and it gives us a difficult time swallowing our food. Food feels like it's getting stuck in the chest. We see it very commonly in young people, and they know how to manage it by drinking lots of liquids, but it's really treatable and it should be found. Another condition which I see frequently is something called SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's where the bacterial balance in our intestine tends to shift for a variety of reasons. And it can lead to a lot of bloating, gas, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, and really make us very, very sensitive in terms of how we eat and how we defecate. So those are at least two disorders which I think are pretty frequently seen, um, but you need a good gastroenterologist uh, to keep an eye on things and to diagnose them for you. Does COVID affect GI issues? So the next question is, does COVID have an impact and does it affect GI issues? For certain, COVID has had a tremendous impact on GI issues. When COVID first started in the spring of 2020, there were a lot of GI bleeding cases, a lot of patients with black stools and bleeding from the lining of their intestine. At that time, there was also a lot of nausea, vomiting, and upper gastrointestinal symptoms that we were seeing. Then what we saw later on last year in 2020 was patients were having a lot of sort of chest pain type syndromes, worsening of their acid reflux, a chest sensitivity syndrome uh, post-COVID. Then symptoms changed again as, as the virus has changed and patients were having lower gastrointestinal symptoms, diarrhea, cramping. Uh, but on the whole, when you look at it, COVID can really cause a variety of GI symptoms within the gastrointestinal tract, including inflammation of the lining of many areas of the GI tract, including inflammation of the pancreas, elevation of your liver test, as well as other things. So it's always good to get treated and stay on top of COVID. What treatment options are available for GI disorders? For GI disorders, the question is, what treatment options are available for GI disorders? There's a gamut of options available. When I see patients, I always try to counsel them on dietary lifestyle behavioral modification, which I think will truly help their disease. And second, depending on the condition that they have, there's always medication therapy by mouth. And in many conditions, it could be certainly things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, many of the inflammatory disorders of the GI tract, they need more heavy duty medication, which may be injectable therapy or IV infusion therapy. But GI conditions, when they're found early, they're readily treatable and patients' quality of life can be a lot better. So seeing your gastroenterologist, making sure you get on the right treatment is very important. I think my goal is always the same, to get the patients to feel better on the minimum amount of therapy required to keep them there. What are the most commonly consumed foods and drinks that negatively affect uh, digestion? The question is, what are the most commonly um, uh, taken in foods and drinks, consumed foods and drinks that negatively impact digestion? So this is quite an interesting question because when we get a lot, you know, especially in the office, what I would say is, when we consume foods, they're broken into, down into different types of sugars and elements. And certain foods which lead to high levels of what's called FODMAP, or F-O-D-M-A-P, tend to cause a lot of issues with bloating, gas, diarrhea, having a sensitive stomach, indigestion, and overall not feeling well. So these are some foods which can be um, uh, high in processed foods. So Processed foods are more difficult to break down. Um, very ripe fruits, especially in the summer, can also give you lots of symptoms. Foods that are high in fiber, although they're very beneficial to your health, sometimes they can clearly lead to GI symptoms. Fatty, greasy foods clearly have an adverse impact on your digestion, as well as other health effects. Consumption of alcohol should always be considered in terms of how it leads to GI symptoms as well as, you know, of course, smoking and, and intake of any kind of tobacco can have a tremendous impact on your GI tract. So when it comes to diet, a well-balanced, healthy diet is always important in avoiding foods that really bother you. But I think a low FODMAP diet for many patients is a key to helping them feel better. What lifestyle changes should I be making if I have GI issues? All right, so the question is, what lifestyle changes should I be making if I have GI issues? 
I think first and foremost, sometimes keeping a food diary is really, really important. I think you can be your own best ally. And by keeping a food diary, you can figure out if there's any particular food groups which adversely impact your GI tract, a big food group being dairy. So lots of patients are very sensitive to dairy, and that's an easy one to sort of eliminate or limit. Certain times, fatty, greasy foods or really processed foods can also have a tremendous impact. But sometimes it can be something as simple as eating lots of peanuts or too many bananas can lead to constipation and other problems. So I think a food diary is the first step in figuring out what changes you can make to your diet. Number two, seeing a nutritionist and having them help you figure out what the best diet is for you is also very important. I think not eating three to four hours before bedtime is a huge lifestyle change most patients can make, which will help their digestion, help them with their acid reflux, and hopefully help them with their overall weight. I think staying uh, moving, let's put it that way, having a less sedentary lifestyle is extremely important when it comes to decre decreasing your risk for GI disorders as well as GI cancers. So stay moving, keep a well-balanced diet, and diet that's very good in terms of, you know, the prebiotics that it has. That's prebiotics or foods that we eat that are broken down and that become fuel for the bacteria in our intestine. A lot of you are familiar with probiotics. Those are just bacteria that we're putting in our system to help uh, elevate levels of good bacteria. But prebiotics are foods that we eat, which are the fuel for the bacteria in the stomach. And if we put in good fuel, you're usually going to get better bacteria in your intestine. And so I think a, a, a clear, wide-based approach of exercise, lifestyle changes, and diet can do wonders for your GI tract, but sometimes it may not eliminate all of your issues, and medication therapy will be valuable. Can GI disorders be hereditary? Uh, the question is, can GI disorders be hereditary? Yes. Many GI disorders have a genetic component. Um, let's start with GI cancers. Okay, so one of the things we didn't talk about because I know it's been talked about before is colon cancer. Colon cancer certainly has a, a familial risk and a genetic risk passed down through generations. Other big conditions within the GI realm are inflammatory bowel disease. Things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are also seen amongst families and relatives have a higher risk of having those items such as celiac disease, which is a problem with ingestion of gluten and how your small bowel operates giving you symptoms, is clearly also has a genetic component. Other issues such as pancreatic or esophageal cancer, liver disease, gallbladder disease, all can have a genetic and hereditary component. So it's important to know your family history and present that family history to your doctor and have them gauge what may be important or necessary next steps in being able to help you. So they just want to repeat the first two questions. And the first two questions are, which organs are included in your digestive system? Sure. So one of the, they, are, they would like us to uh, repeat one of the questions is, what are some of the organs uh, which are included in the digestive system? So it's your esophagus, your stomach, your small intestine, which is made up of three components, okay, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, the large intestine called the colon or the colon and the rectum. And then we've got the pancreas, the biliary tract or, or gallbladder, uh, as well as the liver. Okay, those are those are the big GI organs. And then, what are the most common GI disorders? And the other question is, what are the most common GI disorders? So GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, peptic ulcer disease or ulcer disease of the stomach or gastritis, celiac disease of the small bowel. Okay, chronic diarrhea or constipation uh, are very common inflammatory bowel disorders such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, pancreatitis, gallbladder disease, which is where you get attacks of the gallbladder due to stones, and then certain liver diseases such as fatty liver disease or hepatitis and cirrhosis. Obviously, there's, a, there's quite a few GI disorders. We don't have time to go over all of them, but those are clearly some of the more common ones. If colon cancer runs in my family, do you recommend getting a colonoscopy before the recommended age? Sure. So the question is, if colon cancer runs in my family, 
Should I get a colonoscopy before the recommended age? I think that's a great question. Now the recommendation has moved to 45 for everybody, regardless of your background or regardless of, of your sex. So it should be 45 for average risk individuals. Now, if you've had a mom, dad, brother, or sister with colon cancer, advanced polyps, certainly it should be earlier than that, starting at age 40 or earlier. But you should just get a consultation with a gastroenterologist because sometimes there's successive generations with polyps or cancer or other types of cancer, which may move up the age where you need a colonoscopy. What I like to say about colon cancer is that it's the second or third leading cause of death, but yet it's nearly 100% preventable with a colonoscopy. The other tests out there are very good at finding cancer after you have cancer, but you really missed your chance to prevent cancer altogether. So just like we do pap smears to prevent cervical cancer, a colonoscopy is almost a foolproof way to prevent colon cancer long term, and you should bring it up with your gastroenterologist. What do you recommend in the treatment of GERD? So the question is, what do you recommend in the treatment of GERD? So in the treatment of GERD, first I start with kind of diet and lifestyle. So diet-wise, I would certainly limit citrus food groups, so tomato-based products and orange-based products, so a lot of your tomato sauces. Second, fatty, greasy foods and large meals can certainly lead to reflux, so smaller portion size meals. And then onion, garlic, and mint. Those, that triple combination sometimes can cause a lot of uh, acid reflux. Second, I would decrease the intake of soda or carbonated beverages because they lead to a lot of distension of the GI tract and can worsen acid reflux. And most important, not eating, hopefully four hours before bed. That can be a little bit challenging, so I would say three hours. Being a fellow reflux sufferer myself, I've seen and tried to implement a lot of these changes. They have helped. They're not foolproof but they certainly make a difference. And the last one is, of course, coffee. As a doctor, you're always going to drink coffee, or at least most doctors do. It can certainly lead to a lot of acid reflux. So cutting down on your coffee intake can certainly be beneficial. Do you recommend getting an upper endoscopy if I have extreme GERD or something like that? Okay. So the question is, do you recommend an upper endoscopy if you have severe acid reflux or stomach upset? Certainly an upper endoscopy should be considered for many reasons, including the length of time you've had symptoms, the severity of symptoms, and other symptoms which may be complicating the acid reflux disease that you have. So you should see a gastroenterologist have a discussion about your symptoms and what is happening. It's important to find patients who have severe acid reflux because they can have damage to the lining of the esophagus. And those are the patients we need to and want to treat more aggressively to prevent complications related to acid reflux disease. With the level of therapies we have these days, things are easily treated and prevented, and I think senior gastroenterologists will help you with that. Well, thank you very much for the questions, and uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us, and we look forward to taking care of you. I'm Dr. Bhavik Bhandari. Take care.